with all of my heart. Hallelujah. With all of my heart. All of my heart. 
praise you, Lord. I will praise you, Lord. I will praise you. I will praise you, Lord. I will praise you. I will praise you, Lord. I will praise you, Lord. I will thank you, Lord. I will thank you, Lord. Welcome to Salvation Temple. We are located at 25,000 North Chrysler Drive in Hazel Park, Michigan. We are a Bible-believing, Holy Spirit-led, and excited to have you here for um, our service, either by YouTube, video uh, audience, us live streaming. We just thank you in Jesus' name and everyone in the sanctuary here. Well, praise God, we were able to get up and prepare ourselves to come into fellowship and worship the Lord together this morning. Happy March to all of you. My assignment today is to encourage you to be good to yourself, to take care of yourself, to love yourself, and to be okay doing so. Now everyone here doesn't have a problem in treating themselves well, but for those of us who do, let me ask you a few questions. Now please don't raise your hand. You don't have to shout out loud. Don't have to agree or disagree. Just, this is food for thought. What do you think of yourself? When you get up in the morning, and look at yourself in the mirror, what is your first thought? Do you tell yourself, I'm beautiful? Or do you think you have a lot of work to do, repair work to do, before you get up and go? Are you always finding fault with yourself? If so, why? If so, what are you going to do to change? Do you know what your gifts and strengths are? If yes, are you sharing them with others or keeping them to yourself? What do you feel about yourself? What do you think about yourself? Honestly, do you feel and think about yourself the way God feels and thinks about you? How is your relationship with God? This is especially important. How much time do you spend with him? Could you give him just a little bit more time for him to tell you how much he loves you, how much you're worth, how magnificent you are in his eyes? Do you see God in yourself? Do you believe others see God in you? In our lifetime, we are always reminded to be kind and respectful to others. Let us help those in need if we're able to do so. How often do we remind ourselves that we need to take care of ourselves as well as we take care of others? How well do you believe you will be able to successfully meet someone's needs if you are not in a good position to do so? Some of you are caregivers to your parent, your spouse, your children, friends, or others. Some of you are grandparents who help raise your grandchildren or who are raising your grandchildren. Please, care for yourself 
as much as you care for them. The Gospel according to Mark, chapter 12, verses 30 and 31 reads, Oh, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. This is the first commandment, and the second is, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There's no other commandment greater than these. The question is, how can you love others as you love yourself if you don't love yourself? Love others enough to see your well-being. Love yourself to see your well-being, physically, mentally, and spiritually. God is love. God loves you. Learn to love yourself. Amen. God says to love one another and to love him. Amen. Amen. You know, we have authority in the name of Jesus. And we just can mention his name. And mountains will move. Amen. Amen. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Oh, I praise you. I worship you. I thank you, Lord, for the name of Jesus. There is a name. We love you. 
and we love you. 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 We praise 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 you. We adore 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 you. You're the only living God. 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 You are Savior, you are Lord, and you are God. You're Savior. You are Savior, you are Lord. to hear your precious voice, to hear your message to each of us individually. Lord, we open up our hearts to you, Lord, because we love you, and we know that you love us unconditionally. So, Father, speak to our hearts today. Speak to the innermost parts of our being and tell us, show us what you want us to do. Show us how to walk even in a better way that will be more pleasing to you. Help us to love our neighbors. Help us to love each other and to love ourselves. Oh, Father, we thank you for your goodness. We praise you for your love. We look forward, oh God, to seeing you face to face. And we thank you, oh Lord, for the things that you put in our lives this week so that we can witness for you so that we can glorify you and honor you in all that we do. In Jesus' name we pray. Hallelujah. Amen. Please take your seats. I just welcome you this morning. Here we are already into the month of March. Woo! It seems like time has speeded up, but I'm sure we still have 24 hours in a day. <laughs> okay. We still have 60 minutes in each hour, and um, God has given us the grace, the mercy to live during this time. Amen. 2024 is your season. Amen. You're supposed to be here. You were born for this time, for such a time as this. And um, I pray this morning that you will find out even clearer what God has purposed you for, what your destiny is. You know, God has a plan for your life. He has a roadmap from the day you were born, even till the day you die. So I hope you're following that roadmap. And if you aren't, he always has rerouting. You know how your GPS says, 
hold on, I'm rerouting because you're off track. <laughs> so he has a plan to put you back on track so that you can accomplish everything that he's created you to accomplish. All right, so I want to welcome you again this morning. And um, the Scott sons are still in Texas enjoying their weather, but uh, they'll be with us shortly. So I'll be able to take a rest after this Sunday. <laughs> uh, and I want you to be sure to come out for, to hear them as well. So last week I talked to you about um, Jesus' last few hours on earth. If you were here, if you weren't here, you can read the gospel according to John chapter 13, 14, 15 and all. And um, let's see, what was, I have to see what was my title last week. Anybody remember what my title was? It's an inside job, right? It's an inside job. So this week, um, well, and then last week I talked about how Jesus, you know, he was so personal and friendly and intimate with his disciples. He really, you know, he, he had a purpose. God sent him to bring in, to finish out the Old Testament and bring in the New Testament, the Old Covenant he completed, he fulfilled it, and he introduced the new covenant, a new way to relate to God the Father. And he, he had chosen 12 disciples that God had showed him who to pick. And he picked those disciples. And then we talked about how, um, how much he showed them and how, how intimate their relationship was. And even to the point that even to the very end of his mission on earth, one of them ended up betraying him and deciding to uh, cause him to be murdered. One of his best inner circle friends named Judas, and I'm sure you've all heard of Judas. Sometimes people will call other people, oh, you're a Judas, or there's a Judas. Uh, so Judas was not uh, one of the good guys, but Jesus loved him even until the end. He even protected him after he um, betrayed him. He didn't tell the other disciples, well, you know, this one is getting ready to sell all of us out and I'm going to end up being tortured and murdered. He didn't even tell the disciples that, even though he knew it. He loved Judas until the end. And that's just an example of how God loves us. You know, sometimes we think that when we do bad things or, or we're not perfect, well, God's not happy with us. God loves us unconditionally. And he's called us to learn to love each other just like he loved us. So today we're going to have a different topic. And it's so funny. I have like, I have two sets of type notes and I had to figure out, okay, now which one am I supposed to be using? <laughs> and um, here I crossed out the wrong one. Um, and I have two or three sets of written notes, but that's how, I, that's how I made it through college. You know, I wrote notes, then I studied my written notes and then typed them and all that stuff. So that's how I ended up on the dean's list, okay? <laughs> and I'm a member of the mortar board <laughs> with three babies. <laughs> so today we have another one. Um, I played for you, it's a, uh, last week, it's an, who, I played Rocky, right? Okay, so. Today, I'm going to play this one for you. Okay, so that's what we're talking about today. <laughs> so, you know, Pastor Care always had movies, so it seems like when I come up with titles, I end up with music. <laughs> it's a family affair. <clears throat> so, I want to just... I really, really have a heart this morning to have you to have a different look at Jesus and his ministry. Uh, last week we talked about the last 48 hours. Just think, Jesus lived to be 33. He started his ministry at the age of 30. And so uh, from the ages of 12 up to 30, he was silent. You don't hear anything about what he did during those 18 years. But then when he comes out, uh, he has 
an assignment that has to be accomplished. Uh, there is in, I guess, the Hebrew or somewhere in the Bible, there is such a thing as moeds, M-O-E-D-S. Moeds are set times that God Almighty has set, and these times will be fulfilled, period. One of those times was Jesus' birth. Remember, it was even in the Old Testament, hundreds and hundreds of years, God prophesies things. Everything he does, he tells you what it's going to be before it happens. Little side note, I believe God tells everybody when it's their time on earth is finished. Okay? I don't believe that you're going to die without knowing it. You're going to have some, even unbelievers, usually have some idea that their time on earth is up. So God has moeds. And he had a set time that Jesus would be crucified. Nothing was going to stop that. Even though Judas was um, a betrayer and he was the son of perdition, it was still a choice. So whatever, you know, a lot of people says, well, God's will will be done. Not necessarily. God's will will be done if the people cooperate. But even with God's will being a uh, uh, dependent upon someone's cooperation. He has Moeds. He knows when certain things are going to happen. He knows the, exactly the date, the hour that Jesus will come back to earth. Jesus doesn't know it. And so I want us to look today at how the different roles that God has given us in this world, because some, some of us, when we're praying, we're squishing everything together. Sometimes we pray to Jesus. Sometimes we try to get in the spirit. You know, sometimes we pray to God. So I want us today to really hone in on who's responsible for what. Because the kingdom of God is all of us working together, but each of us has a specific responsibility. All right. So last, um, when we talked last week, I think it was in the gospel according to uh, John chapter 13. We talked about Jesus, you know, he had the last supper. Uh, everybody, when we take communion, you know, that's a representation of the last supper. When we take the wine and the bread. And then, then Jesus got up and he washed his disciples' feet. Now that was like the Thursday before his crucifixion. You know, he died and stayed in the grave three days that math kind of messes me up because it's almost like it wasn't really three days. When he had the Last Supper during the Passover, that's called Monday Thursday, M-A-U-N-D-Y. So that was Thursday when he had the foot washing, the Last Supper, okay? And then they called, this is just trivia, okay? Um, and then the Sunday before that Thursday was called Palm Sunday. That's when he came into Jerusalem and they took palms and spread them on the ground and the donkey, he rode on the donkey and all. That was Palm Sunday. Then you have Holy Wednesday. And then when he had the, uh, the, the Last Supper and the foot washing was on Maundy Thursday. So now we're coming and then you go to Good Friday, which is when he was crucified. And then they say he stayed in the grave three days and three nights. But then he rose on Sunday morning. So, you know, I'm sure there's a technicality that I'm missing because my math and Bible math is probably not the same. But anyway, that's that Holy Week. So we're talking now about the Holy Week. We're talking about Jesus going up to the point, place where he would finish his purpose. And he knew it. Just think, the age of 33 is not really that old. You only uh, have had three years to really do what God has called you to do. And the scripture says that Jesus, he was fully man and he felt all the things that people feel, the emotions, the physical pain. Just think, he would have wanted to be married. If he had, and most Jewish men were married in their uh, early 20s. So here he was, and look, um, this is just being the, the curling that I am. Here this woman, she got this long pretty hair and she put all this expensive good smelling perfume in her hair and she's washing Jesus' feet. You think he's just like, oh, holy, holy, holy. <laughs> but I want you to see the humanity 
because he was the son of man, but he was also the son of God. But he put off his deity while he was here for those 33 years so that he could show us how to live in the new kingdom. All right. So we talked about Jesus having spent those three years um, doing his mission. He had the last supper and he washed the disciples feet. He had emotions just like we have emotions. So he is touched with the feelings of your infirmity, whatever goes on in your life. Jesus can understand it. You know, sometimes we say, well, uh, the people we love, they don't understand how we feel. You know, they, they really don't get it. I was talking to some um, man who, he was, he's a pre was a preacher, is a preacher, or whatever, and he lost his wife. And he was saying that he used to minister to people and talk to people who lose their family members. But until he lost his wife, he never really understood it. So he thought he did. So a lot of times we think we understand, but until we actually go through a lot of things. And so Jesus went through that so that he could totally uh, sympathize and, and have compassion for us so that whatever is going on in our life, he knows when somebody sexually abuses you. He knows when somebody is hurting your feelings or when you don't have enough money or they, they're promoting everybody but you even though you deserve it. You know, he knows maybe the threats that we feel. Some people don't even feel safe in their own homes because people are violent, you know, but God knows that and he has an escape and a way out. So that's why we have to, you know, uh, take time and spend to find out, okay, Lord, what is your, your purpose, your plan for me? Um, so we're gonna take up where we left off in the gospel according to John chapter 13, 31 in the New Living Translation. Uh, the gospel according to John 13, 31. <clears throat> and did I put that up there? And it says, <clears throat> as soon as Judas left the room, the t Jesus said, the time has come for the son of man to enter into his glory and God will be glorified because of him. So I want you to pay attention to who he's talking about and what those people do. He says, the time has come for the son of man himself to enter into his glory. Remember I played the Rocky music for you. So he's getting ready to go crucif be crucified. And he says, I'm getting ready to be glorified. It was, I'd almost want to say, well, skip the glory. <laughs> Cause you're getting ready to be really abused and God will be glorified because of him. All right. So this was the Thursday before, the day before he's getting ready to be crucified. Um, and he says, uh, so finally, Jesus was trying to tell the disciples, teach them. He's, he's just with this small group now because this is his last little meeting with the disciples to try to reiterate to them. He's taught them for three years, but it's like, I only got a few more hours. Let me just say this again, because he said all these things before. He says, you know, so let me at least try to get this into them again. And he says, <clears throat> he says that he's going to go to glory and be glorified. And he told them that he is physically leaving and he has one new commandment. He is physically not going to be with them and they don't get it. They don't understand because he's babied them for three years. He spoiled them. He gave them everything. He showed them everything that the father had showed him. And then if we go to uh, chapter 13, just go down a few more verses to verse 33. He says, dear children. So now he's calling his disciples. He's like, I need to teach you this because this is where you are emotionally right now. Dear children. I will be with you only a little longer. And as I told you, the Jewish leaders, as I told the Jewish leaders, you will search for me, but you can't come where I'm going. The next verse, 34, says, so now I'm giving you a new commandment. Love each other just as I have loved you. You should love each other. And then 35, your love for one another will prove to the world that you are my disciples. So now he has 
encapsulated, summarized what they need to do when he leaves this earth. He says, I'm going and this is my commandment. So this is the most important thing that he's telling them to do. He's giving them the final details about his departure. And up until this point, their whole tradition of how to honor God and their Jewish faith was taught to them from childhood. So now here is Jesus bringing them this new way of living. And for the last three years, Jesus uh, had fulfilled everything that they had been taught to do in their Jewish tradition. Remember, they had to offer sacrifices. They had to go to the priest and they had to do certain things to be able to commune with God. All of that was stopping. No more sacrifices. Remember how Jesus, when he had gone to the temple and they were selling, uh, selling doves and things in the temple and he took a whip and he, he beat them out and said, you know, this, my father's house shall be called a house of prayer, not a den of thieves, you know, because they're in there robbing the people, making them pay too much. So he's changing how people now, all of those hundreds of years, thousands of years, they, they went to God in prayer in a certain way. And he's changing all of that. He is absolutely. So this is a big change. But guess what? They don't get it. How many of us are born again and we still don't get some of the ways that God deals with us? Okay. So I just want to, um, I want to point out some of the things that John, the writer of the gospel here, I want you to listen. I'm just going to um, point out some of the things that some of these verses say, and I want you to key in on the, the words. Okay. Remember, I'm talking about a family affair. So who's supposed to be doing what in this family? Who does this family include? So uh, we need to find out who is God? Who is Jesus? Who is the Holy Spirit? Where do we fit in all that? Je Jesus emphasized to all who would believe on him. So if we believe on him, he's going to take us in a whole new trajectory. And even when we read the gospel according to John chapter 3, verse 16, which Pastor Scott, Dr. Scott used to read every week, it's, it's, it's the most well-known verse in the Bible. You go to ball games, you'll see signs, John 3, 16. You'll be driving along the highways, you see um, uh, roofs, at least in Ohio, you know, they got barns and things. They'll see you'll see John 3, 16. This is the most famous uh, scripture in the Bible because it totally explains the gospel. So if you, if you know the gospel, you should really know this scripture by heart. It says, verse 16, it says, For God so loved the world, God so loved the world, that he, God, gave his only begotten son, Jesus, that whoever believes in Jesus, him, should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him, Jesus, might be saved. So how do people, who do get people get saved through Jesus or Father God? Jesus. Through Jesus, okay? So, I want you to pick up. So we put so much emphasis on Jesus. You know, there are denominations. They're Jesus only people. They only believe in Jesus. You know, Jesus is superior to God. But I want you to listen to these different scriptures. And you can, if you want to write the reference, you can. If you don't, just these are in um, the gospel according to John. All of them are in John. In fact, John talks about the word. He speaks of the word father 111 times just in his gospel. And in chapters 14, 15, and 16, he talks about Father God over 50 times, just in those three chapters. So he wants, the, he wants us to see something that we haven't really been paying attention to. In 517, he says, the Father works, this is Jesus, Jesus is saying, the Father works and I work. And then, over in John chapter 5, I'm gonna, I'm gonna read this one. 5 and verse 18 and 19 says, Therefore the Jews sought all the more to kill him because he not only broke the Sabbath, but also said that God was his father, making himself equal with God. Then Jesus answered and said to them, Most assuredly, I say to you, 
The son can do nothing of himself, but, he, but what he sees the father do for whatever he, the, he does, the father, whatever the father does, the son also does in like manner. Okay, that's uh, in chapter 5. And further on in 5 it says, the father loves the son. The father shows the son what to do. 26, verse 26, 526 says, the father has life in himself and gave life to the son. Okay, Pastor Lynn, can you bring those things over here for me? In chapter 5, verse 30, it says, the son can do nothing without the father. Jesus, okay, and you don't have to put these scriptures up because I just want people to absorb this. So chapter 5, verse 30 says, the son can do nothing without the father. Jesus does only what the father wills. Jesus came in his father's name. Verse chapter 6, 32 says, my father gives you the true bread from heaven. 644 says, no man can come to the father unless God the father draws him. You see where I'm going with this? Okay. And then when you go to chapter 14, I think I asked you all to put that one up. Let's go to John chapter 14 and uh, verse 12, the gospel according to John chapter 14, verse 12, it says, most assuredly, I say to you, he who believes in me, who's talking? Jesus, Jesus says, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also, whoever believes in him. And greater works than these he will do, because I go to my Father. And whatever you ask in my name, that I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. Okay, so I have a little um, illustration because I want our prayer life to be exactly what it should be. And I want us to see ourselves like we're really supposed to see. Um, I told Sister um, Anita, it's like, okay, so she tried to pray my, um, pray through all of my message today, okay? So, of course, the big one is God the Father, okay? This is Jesus. He's not as big, and truthfully, he really, his role is not as big. This is Holy Spirit, which is smaller or different than Jesus and God, okay? So as it's, when it says the Father, we are speaking to a larger, um, a larger spirit, a larger person. God created the whole earth. The devil was created by God. Why would God create something that has more power than him? Why would he create something that has more ability than him in any way? <laughs> Jesus says that he and the Father are one. He looks like the Father. You see the Father, you see me. Okay, and now he's going to go on to tell us, uh, and then he tells you what, how the Holy Spirit plays into that. God the Father created heaven and earth. Jesus was with God the Father before the earth was created, but he wasn't as the son of man. He was the son of God in heaven. He became the son of man 4,000 years after Adam, okay? And then the Holy Spirit was with God in creation too. When God spoke the word, and what is the word? Jesus, then the Holy Spirit comes along to do what was spoken. That system still works today. So when you're praying, you need to see that. And he's going to tell us who to pray, how to do it, and then how it's going to be manifested. Okay? And it's real important. When you do that, you will know who you are. 
in Christ. See, you can't just go to the Father. Okay? There are some things you got to do. All right? So we're going to get to that. Okay. So I think we read that was um, the gospel according to John chapter 14. So <clears throat> let's see. Did I do all of those? So I told you all those things about when Jesus emphasized or, or about who his father was. In chapter 14 um, of John, I'm going to read, let's see, verse 9. Did I already read 19 and 20? Okay, so let's go to 14, verses 19. And do I want to go there? No. Let's go to verse 12, chapter 14, verse 12. Okay, so this is the last 48 hours, last 24 hours that Jesus has to teach to his disciples, right? Okay, so he says, Most assuredly, I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also, and greater works than these he will do because I go to my Father. Okay, he says, he who believes in me, let's go back there, believes in me, Jesus, the works that Jesus does. Now, this is, this is y'all. Okay, this is Holy Spirit, and this is us. Okay, Jesus says, the works that he does, because he's going to his Father, because of that, if he's not there, you can't do it. Because of that, you will do the same miracles, signs, wonders, healings that Jesus does. Okay? So just follow that. Follow that. Okay? Um, and then it says, verse 13. Let's go there. It says, and whatever you, disciples, you Salvation Temple, you believers, whatever you ask in my name, who is my name? Jesus. Jesus. That I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask anything, if you, way little you, hear you, little you, you ask anything in his name, the Father, it, you ask the Father in his name, he will do. And I'm going to explain that even better. And then if, um, if I look at verse 15, it says, If you love me, keep my commandments. And I will pray the Father, and he will give you another comforter. But verse 15 says, here's the little caveat. In order for you to do, to work in that um, position, here's what he says. You have to love him. You have to love. Faith works by love. Okay? So he says he's going to send the, ver um, the Holy Spirit to them after he goes back to heaven. And this Holy Spirit is what God had promised. Here, this is Holy Spirit. He says he's going to send him after he goes back to heaven. So before Jesus, he wasn't on the earth to living people. It's just God and Jesus. Holy Spirit was not available. Okay? He was going to go and send the Holy Spirit. So until after Jesus died and went to heaven and was there for 40 days, they did not have this. So these Holy Spirit and us were by ourselves. We were on earth alone. We, there was just Jesus and God. If you needed help, you had to try to get it from either one of them, mostly God. Okay. Um, in, in 19, he, Jesus says, I am in my Father. Okay, new concept. Jesus says, I am in my Father. And you are in me. All, the only restriction is to love one another. If you love Jesus, then God loves you. Jesus says, he who loves me, I will manifest myself to him. So we're back to Jesus now. Okay, and then we got Holy Spirit. I got to keep these two together because I have to make a point. 
Um, if you love Jesus, if you love Jesus, then God loves you. And Jesus said that he loves you and will manifest himself to you. In 23, he said, the word I speak, the words that Jesus sp spoke for miracles and things, they didn't come from him. They came from the Father. So my point to you, when you ask the Father or when you do something, whose words are you using? Did God tell you to do what you're doing? Did he tell you that you needed this or the things that you want from God? Are you speaking your words or did you get them from God that promises you those things you want? You know, a lot of people have good hearts, good intentions, and they'll say, well, God will do it for you. He won't do everything for you. Did he promise you that? Because you may not be able to handle what somebody else can handle. Jesus says he spoke only the Father's words. Where did he get those words? He went to the Father in prayer. How did he know to go? He had a route he was supposed to take. And he said, he told his disciples, we're going to have to take a, a detour because I need to go to Samaria. Because there's something that God wants me to do in Samaria. How do you think he got that instruction? He got it from his father. So when he went and done, did a whole nother mission, good deed, because he had heard the father's words. What did God tell you to do this morning? You know, it's not written in here. He may have said, go buy uh, Kroger's, pick up a ham, and go take it over to Sue. Okay? When you spend time with God in prayer, he gives you his instruction, his words. It may come through a song. It may come just to your mind, a thought, just like me. Uh, uh, it's a family affair. God can use anything to tell you, but he's going to tell you what you need to do. And when he tells you something, he empowers it. The grace for it is there. That's how Jesus was able to do miracles, signs, and wonders. And some of us are trying to claim miracles, signs, and wonders, and God didn't tell you to do that miracle. Jesus said he doesn't pray for everybody. He didn't heal everybody. When he went to the pool where the people were, all of them had some kind of disabilities, he only healed one man. One. You know, it, there were times when he, he didn't even pray for some people. In his town, they didn't believe him, so he didn't pray. He don't, you know, so just because you have a good idea and just because it's a good thing, did God tell you to do it? Because if he didn't, he's not, uh, he doesn't have to respect what you do. Okay? <clears throat> so the only restrictions that we have when he tells us to do something is that we have to do it in love. In... Um, Verse 23, he said, the words that I speak are my father's. And then he says in verse 26, he said, um, let me go to there to make sure I'm in the right place here. He says, um, the helper. Yeah. He says, the father is going to send you a helper. That's Holy Spirit. So now we have father doing one thing, Jesus doing something and the Holy Spirit doing something. He says, I will send the helper. Um, and, or the, he's going to pray. Jesus is going to pray to the Father to send us the Holy Spirit. Jesus will pray. So we don't get Holy Spirit without Jesus praying. Okay? God has methods, and we have to learn his methods. The Father will send the helper when I leave. And then the Holy Spirit will come in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus. And he says in 28, he says, I am going to the Father. Jesus says, I am going to the Father who is what? Greater. So you have to understand the Father is greater. So that means if you get the Father's attention, you have all power ever. God is El Elyon, the most high God. 
Jesus came so that you can have access to the most high God. Jesus is saying, yeah, I'm bad. I'm good. I'm tough. I got a lot, you know, but I'm going to him so that you can have direct access back to him. Just like the original Adam had. Adam walked and talked with God. God had a regular appointment with him. Uh, God talked to Cain and Abel. He had face to face with those grandchildren. <laughs> God is the real deal. And just think, we walk around afraid of stuff. Anything. How can you be afraid if you are a child of God? You're only brothers, sisters with Jesus. You are a child of God. That's how you can love anybody because they are children of God too. He created them. You can love those spouses who act like they're Beelzebub's children. <laughs> but because of who you are, you have the nature of God. So I don't want to get ahead of myself, but I want to stay on time. OK, so if we go on then to uh, chapter 15. Um, <clears throat> in the end of 20 of the end of 14 says, I am going to the father who is greater than I. In chapter 15, four, Jesus says, abide. He's talking to us. He says, abide in me. Abide in him. He says, and I will abide in you. So if you see Jesus, can you see me? No. Okay. He says, if you abide in me, I will abide in you and I will bear fruit because I'm the vine and you are the branches. Okay. You don't have to put these up there. In seven, he says again, abide in me. He tells you again. He says, you know, he's getting ready to show you this good thing that he has orchestrated, that it, God has already prepared for us. And if you abide in me, which is the word, you can ask what you will. Okay. Uh, in verse seven, he tells us, he says, um, let me go up here. I'm in the wrong chapter, 15 and seven. He says, um, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, you abide in me, my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire. This is Jesus. You got to learn his words. Amen. Yes, you get saved, but you find out what are his words. Let those words live in you. He says, then you can ask what you will, and it will be done for you. Okay? Um, verse 17. See, I don't need to go there. I told you I got my notes all. So, uh, oh, here we go. And then jumping back to 14, I got to go back to 14. Jesus, when he was telling the disciples, you know, he's going away and he, they won't see him again and they're still they still don't get the picture and all of that back in 14 the first thing he said which we talked about last week was let not your heart be troubled believe in god believe also in me and then he went on to say in my father's house so his father has a room he says but i'm going to go prepare a place for you and he says and i will come back for you he says in verse six, I am the way. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. No man can get to here without coming through here. Okay, you got to go through Jesus. No man can come to the Father except through me. Um, Jesus says in verse eight, the disciple said, Lord, show us the Father, and it suffices us. And he says, have I been with you so long you don't know me? If you've seen me, if you've seen me, you can see the Father. He says, do you not believe that I am in the Father? I am in the Father, and the Father is in me. 
the words that I speak to you, I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does the works. Believe me, I am in the Father. Just listen to him. He just keeps saying the same thing. I am in the Father, the Father in me. Or believe me for the work's sakes. And then we jump down to 12. He says, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also. So you are going to get this today. <laughs> Verse 13. He says, whatever you ask in my name, I will do it, that the Father may glor be glorified. And then he says that you, he's going to send us the helper. The helper is going to help us to get it. In verse 16, he says, I will pray the Father, and he will give you a helper, that he may abide with you forever. And that helper is called the Spirit of Truth. And he says that we know him because the Spirit of Truth is going to live in us, dwell in us. He says we will know the Spirit of Truth because he dwells with you and will be in you. So these two are going to be inseparable. And then later on, he says, in that day, when I go to see my father, you will know that I am in my father. You won't see him anymore. He says, in that day, you will know I am my father, and you are in me, and I in you. He who loves me will be loved by my father, and I will love and manifest myself to him. And then just a uh, couple more. He says, these things I have spoken to you while being present. But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things. Let not your heart be troubled. And he says, now I have to go because I'm going on, um, because the enemy, the, the Satan is coming. So now I've got to go and do what I was sent here to do. Okay? So, bringing this all to a head. <clears throat> All right. So, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, believers. God created us in Genesis that we would multiply, replenish, subdue the earth, and have dominion. Okay? The first Adam lost it, and Satan became the God of this world. Jesus came back so that we could have what the first Adam lost. So he became the righteous man. We, when we believe in Jesus, we become, we are buried with Jesus in baptism, in water baptism. You die, when you believe in Jesus, you, your spirit, that would have gone, had to go to hell, died, literally died. If he hadn't, if you don't receive, anybody who does not receive the forgiveness of sins through Jesus will go to hell. But because you believe on Jesus, you received him, then you are now buried with him and raised up with him. When you go into the water, the baptism, the waters of baptism, your spirit man is circumcised. The old man dies. You have a whole new nature. So this is your spirit man. Your spirit man has whatever Jesus becomes, you identify with Jesus. And then since we are in the flesh, God sends the Holy Spirit so that our spirit, soul, and body can be protected and sealed by Holy Spirit. He will be in you and with you until you go back to Jesus. Amen. They're glued, okay? Now, when you pray, because you are in your humanity, God still cannot talk to you or have a relationship with you without the blood of Jesus. Right. Here's my real main point. So anytime you want to have access to the Father, you are in Christ. Amen. You live in him. You abide in him. He says you are him and he is you. You become one with him. So whenever you pray and you feel like a heathen, no, he's talking about the spirit man, your spirit man. Yeah, your flesh is still messed up. 
You know, your want to's, your attitude, you still bad, okay? But your spirit man that identifies with Christ will stay saved. God seals you. That's why you want your teenagers and your kids, your husband, your everybody, you want them saved. Let God seal them because they don't become unglued. Holy Spirit keeps them. Jesus said, I haven't lost one, only the one that didn't want to. So, but anytime you want to go to God, Jesus said, me and my father are one. The father gave all of his power to Jesus. Where are you? In Christ. Always. Always. You have access to God all the time because you are in Christ. The Holy Spirit seals you to Christ. You are always always in his presence because of Jesus. So when people, you know, you have these authority of believers, you only have authority because of this, but you got it. Jesus says all power has been given. God the Father loved him so much, he says all power has been given to me. And then he, he told us, believers, and so now I give it to you. So you got this little dinky one that has the power of all of this. Hey, who are you? Who are you? You are a child of the Most High God. Act like it, okay? Act like you are the child of God. Quit, work, quit walking around acting like the ghettoite and the heathen and the uneducated. Hey, I'm all that and a piece of whatever, a chip or whatever. <laughs> all right? So it's a family affair. All of it works together. And you got to have all three. But that's why, especially when you get the Holy Spirit saves you and seals you. But you can have even more of Holy Spirit to get baptized with him. You know, when you baptize with him, that means that the Holy Spirit has even more access to you, to your hearing. All right. So I'm finished. <laughs> I hope you got it. I hope, you know, you walk with the big cheese. You sit at his table. He loves you. He sent his son for you to give you anything and everything. And in, 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 in chapter 17, he talks about Jesus says, that's his prayer. If you really want to be excited, read what Jesus says. He finished everything that God told him to do. You are who God says you are. You can do what God says you can do. Just do the work. Amen. Study the word. Pray. Speak. Uh, be baptized in the Holy Ghost. Um, speak with tongues. But even apart from all of that, you are a child of the Most High God. He says he will come and live with you. He will dwell in you. He'll make his home in you. Just think. You raise up, you, when you get up in the morning, you get up with God Almighty. When you go to bed, when you go to work, hey, greater is he, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Let me pray. Let's pray. Father, we glorify you. Oh, you've paid such a, an awesome ransom for us. And we want to walk in the fullness of who you are. We thank you for your grace, your ability to help us do everything that you've called us to do. And Father, we thank you because we're going to do everything that you created us to do. We love you. We praise you. Just keep on talking to us. Speak louder. When we are hard-headed, Father, just keep on talking. Forgive us and just keep on leading and guiding us because we trust in your love. We know you love us. We pray over our families. We thank you. We claim them for the kingdom of God. And we say send laborers into their pathway so that they can start living their good life that you have destined for them, that they can live it faster. Oh, Father, give us ears to hear today. Tell us where this message is supposed to touch our hearts. Help us, Father. 
We thank you, we thank you, we thank you. In the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, amen, 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 amen. All righty. Sister Deborah's going to come on. <clears throat>